Hi, this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. In today's show, I'm delighted to be joined by the musician, guitarist, songwriter and author, Zal Clemenson. Hi, Bob. Nice. Nice to join you. Hi there. You originally played in the Glasgow-based band Teargast, and then you found fame with the Sensational Alex Harvey band. And I think I, I spoke before you and you were saying that I, you were the first band I saw. What a great band! Yeah, excellent band. Yeah, good fun. All, 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 all good. Well, most of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, before we we sort of talk about the music and that, how have how have the last eighteen months been for you? Yeah, with the lockdown and stuff. Yeah, initially it was quite difficult, you know, because I live in a small village in West Yorkshire. And it's quite it's, 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 I wouldn't say it was isolated, but it's, it's, it's quiet. And then, um, uh, it's like one road in, one road out sort of thing. So it, um, uh, yeah, it, it felt quite, it felt quite, uh, quite a pressure really to be, to be stuck at home. And, uh, you know, there was moments when you thought you couldn't get out to do anything. But yeah, generally speaking, I just occupied my time working on some songs. Yeah. And doing a, doing a bit of writing as well. So, yeah, the music, the music, I think was uh, was a bit of a saviour, really, just something to do. That's great. Yeah, I, th- I think it's been very difficult for a lot of people, and I don't know about you, but I, I found sort of a lot of the days very, very similar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great um, thing. I think Netflix must have done very well. Yeah, a lot of TV, a lot of football. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> So we, before we talk about your musical career, tell us about your journey and how you came into the music industry. Well, it all started at school. Yeah. Um, when we were about 14, 14, 15 years old, we got together a band at school in Glasgow. Who, um, and there was a couple of other guys in the, in the school, a couple of guys in the guy in my class. And they all just fancied the idea of, of, of learning to play something and learning to... Uh, to play music and I chose the guitar one guy chose the drums etc so it was a bit like you know pick the instrument and then go on with it so this band was called the Bull Weevils yeah. and um, this must have been around about 65 66-ish something like that and yeah we just kind of loved to play a few songs I mean I'd been listening to when I started to get interested in the guitar, well, maybe a few years before that, when I'd heard for the first time when I was living in Australia as a child, I heard first time I heard Elvis Presley and and Scotty Moore, the guitar player then, and, and yeah. you know Bill Haley and the Comets and Buddy Holly, those kind of acts in the um, in the very early sixties, and that kind of you know pricked up my ears when I heard that. It was a kind of noise, a kind of sound that I liked. Yeah. You know, and um, at that point, my parents, bless them, were listening to things like like uh, Doris Day and Bing Crosby and, and, and people like that, you know, Frank Sinatra and so on. So I had a lot of music going around in the house at the time. Um, but then when I started to hear, as I say, I started to hear that kind of rock and roll type, type of sound and kind of guitar noise. And then, of course, along came Chuck Berry. Oh yeah, and uh, and that was me. I just thought, wow, that is a great sound. That's a great noise. I need to learn to, to do that. And that's one of the first things, one of the first things I learned to play on the guitar was to learn. And I think for a lot of people, for certainly for a lot of rock guitar players, yeah. Chuck Berry is probably the most influential guitarist of them all. For my, you know, in my opinion. And did did you have any lessons, or did you? Did you no, sort of... I never. No, I never. I never ever had any lessons. No. I uh, also heard another guitarist called Wes Montgomery and a sort of contemporary of his called Kenny Burrell, they were a jazz guitar player. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, they made a kind of sound. Wes Montgomery in particular used to play with a lot of octaves, the style of playing octaves together, and I thought that was just such a beautiful sound. Um, so it was like, that was something that I learned, a technique that I learned, Um and brought it into my own playing, brought it into the more the rock style of playing. You hear a lot of guitar players using it. Uh, I've used it ever since. But yeah. Um, So, yeah, so we got the band off the ground and we started to play, play the school dance, like prom night type thing. We played church halls, we played town halls around Scotland. We had an agent who was also at the same school as us, so we all kind of stemmed out from the same place. Yeah. And 
he worked to get us some gigs and things like that. So we started to gig the weekends, back to school on Monday to Friday, and then gig again the following weekend, and that went on for quite a, for quite a while. Yeah, we had a couple of morphing sort of episodes from Bull Weevils to Tear Gas, but yeah, we kind of went through a little bit of a, a detour with a couple of other lineups that uh, that were you know kind of similar to what we'd been doing. Yeah. And at that point, we were playing mostly, well, what you had to play was basically dance music. And our, our main interest, and most of the bands around Glasgow and Scotland were playing, effectively playing black American soul music, R&B music, Tamla, yeah. Stax, those kind of labels. Joe Tex, all that sort of thing, and um, so that was the kind of music that that I was brought up on. Wasn't uh, listening to Steve Cropper, you know, playing from the the Stacks, oh yes, Memphis R and B yeah, bands, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Sam and Dave and all those sort of people. So that was a real big influence on us at that time. Obviously, when when you hear of a lot of the Stacks stuff and, and that type of stuff, the guitar sounds yeah. quite clean, maybe with a bit of reverb on. When yeah. when did the thing about the more distorted type of sound was that just Hendrix or had it started before? We when did you yeah, start playing with I, more distortion? Yeah, I think it was Hendrix to, to a degree. I can't really date things specifically, no. but um, tear gas. Obviously, when we sort of morphed into tear gas, we were listening much more to the looking at Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, and, and looking at to kind of bands, some of the American, heavier American bands as well. Yeah. So that was obviously a, yeah, that was a bit of a, a bit of a transition from the, as you say, the clean, funky kind of guitar style into the more improvised, if you like, Henry's very improvised a lot of the time. So yeah, there was a kind of more of a free form approach to playing along with that particularly big sound. Yeah, and I guess it you, you sort of found that it enabled you to get more sustain and, and play play perhaps a little bit differently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you just kind of went through a, went through a, a sort of process of choosing amplifiers that yeah. basically give you more and more gain yeah. and uh, and more and more speakers and so on. So the thing was getting you know the thing was getting the tear gas in particular were very loud. I mean, the pretty loud band. You know, I can recall the sort of. You know, as I said to you earlier, we were playing games that most people were just there to dance. Yeah. And the problem with tear gas was that you just couldn't dance tear gas. It was much more prog rock. So we had a bit of a problem sort of transitioning over to... So eventually we had an audience that, instead of dancing, they just sort of sat cross-legged in front of us on the floor. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we got into that whole thing, you know, and that was much more of the prog rock, um, heavy metal, heavy rock sort of some side of things. Yeah, and, d- and did you realise at the time that you were sort of getting your own sound, that it was your sound and, and d- a bit different yeah. to a lot of other people? I mean, I was I was, I was was heavily influenced by Jeff Beck and Richie Blackmore at the time yeah. and the kind of sound that they were getting, that kind of, that kind of bigger guitar sound where the guitar was the prominent, you know, instrument in the music. So, yeah, for me, it was a case of, like, sort of kind of joining in with, with, with those kind of guitar heroes and, yeah, trying to learn some of their techniques and some of their licks and so on, and then eventually I had Frank Zappa, and I thought to myself, right, forget it, just play the guitar your own way. Yeah, you yeah. know, because that that's that's really where it comes out at the end. You know, you so very well listening to people and copying people and learning to play some riffs and so on, but you really got to put your own stamp on it at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I got one Zappa album, but it was later, it was about seventy eight, seventy nine, from Joe's Garage. Yeah. Um, so it's probably yeah, those guys, after the main part. Albums, yeah. yeah, yeah. So when how did the Alex Harvey band start? Did some of the guys from um, your first band join that band with you? Is that, is that how it worked out? No, Tear two, two Gas were a four piece by then. Yeah. Um, with Ted and Hugh McKenna, the cousins. Hugh was singing, Chris went on bass and myself on guitar. So it was four, four piece. And we were struggling a bit. We'd made a couple of albums uh, as Tear Gas, and they were, they were okay. And, didn't make a fortune, didn't make a lot of money. No. Hardly made any money, to be honest. But, so we were kind of floundering a little bit. The band was perhaps getting close to calling it a day. And and, um, and then fortunately, our manager, Eddie Tolman, the guy in Glasgow, and Alex's manager, Bill Fahili, who was in London, they must have they got themselves, they got, they got together and, and uh, I think put together the idea that Alex was looking for a band and you could say that we were in a way in some way looking for a singer. Um, so they kind of initiated this uh, get together.
together. This meeting with Alex in Glasgow, he came to Glasgow, brought his guitar, yeah. and um, they booked us a little rehearsal room up here in Glasgow. So not up here, but in Glasgow. And um, yeah, so we just got together. Alex took out his guitar, and he played a riff. Yeah. And he says to he said to Tom Burns, he says, "Can you guys play this riff?" And it happened to be the riff for Midnight Moses, the oh. track on the train album. Oh, yeah. And we just looked at each other and we went, uh, you know, so eventually we beat the shit out of this riff. <laughs> and I could see Alex, he just turned around with a huge grin on his face. Yeah. As if to say, yeah, that'll do. And oh, that yeah. is pretty much how the band kind of got off the ground. It was almost as though it was meant to happen. Yeah, I think he knew what he was wanting. As soon as he heard Tear Gas play, yeah. Um, I think he knew exactly what he was wanting to hear. I mean, we'd ha- we had actually played a gig with him um, in support uh, at the Marquee in London. Oh, yeah. But he had a band called Giant Moth. Yeah. Uh, who turned out, well, on the night, it just seemed quite dreadful from what I could hear. But I think that was a moment in time when the management team were trying to get Alex to kind of take a little sly look at what Tear Gas were doing and we could take a look at what he was doing. Yeah. And... Um, even though the band Giant Moth were not, they were not great, I could see something in Alex. I could see a, 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 a pre, you know, presence. There was something about his, his performance and, and the way he went about it. I thought, yeah, this guy's got something. Yeah, he, he definitely had that yeah. charisma, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he, he was he was quite a bit older than you guys, wasn't he, at the time? Well, he's a generation ahead of us, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he'd, he'd probably he'd, he'd probably influenced by stuff in the sort of early fifties, I guess. Well, we. We, ha- we didn't know Alex before that, but we knew of him. Yeah. Um, he had a band called uh, the Alex Harvey Big Soul Band, which was going in the late 60s, mid 60s, and so on. They went through, and they were playing, you know, like James Brown type stuff, the horn section, and so on. And they were just a fantastic band. Yeah. And Alex was a very consummate performer, and he, he had all that stuff down. He had all that style, all that style of singing, you know, that soul thing. But when he started, when we. When we got together with him, he, 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 he had a completely different approach. As though he completely sort of switched off from anything that had influenced him in the past. Yeah. And I could see that he wanted to do something very different. He was very focused, very professional. Yeah. And he had, um, and, and he was very productive. He had lots of really cool songs, cool riffs sitting around, yeah. just waiting to be played properly and performed properly. When did the um, sort of theatrical element of the Sensational Alex Harvey Band kick off? Was that was that like an intention at the beginning? Well, no, it wasn't an intention. I think Alex perhaps knew that he wanted to turn it into something very focused and very um, visual. Yeah. Uh, he walked in their musical hair in the West End of London. He played oh, right. guitar in the pit band. Yeah. And God knows how he got that job because he's no guitar player anyway. <laughs> He just played alongside uh, Mike Oldfield, I think, at one time. Oh, really? But, um, so I think perhaps some of that rubbed off on him. You yeah. know, watching, playing their night after night, watching their musical here. I think a bit of that, yeah, yeah, rubbed off. And he, and he, and he, and he knew, and he, he, the first, very few first gigs that we played, Alex was very, very focused on getting across some sort of message to the audience. He was completely, you know, in that. In that zone of, of you know eye to eye contact with people, and and it was and it was quite intense. And as we as things develop, I used to have a style of I used to amuse myself by making sort of guitar heroes. I always found guitar heroes that had these sort of ang- ang- anguished sort of expressions on their faces, yeah. you know, when they're playing guitar solos and yeah. strutting about and posing around and doing all that. I found that quite hilarious. So I kind of had this sort of part of me decided to just take the piss out of all of that and it became became a little bit of a trademark you know of um, aping these guitar heroes sort of styles and, and, and the anguished faces and all that sort of yeah. thing until eventually as the gigs got bigger and bigger I was told that people that you know further back in the hall they couldn't see what you were doing right. they can't see all the visuals that are going on Yeah. so we, we sort of went to try and find a, a, a way of, of projecting that that performance of them further into the hall, and that's where the idea of the white face, the mind face. Yeah. I went to see Marcel Marceau in New York. Oh, and, yeah. And we got some ideas, and we put together the face that just became a bit of a trademark. 
Yeah, it was an extremely powerful image, I think. I remember seeing mm. it, you know, you and Alex at the front there. That was mm. brilliant. And and so you got you got together, the first album was framed, um, and then I guess it was sort of on the road touring constantly, was it? Yeah, once the band took off, once the album framed was recorded, there was a kind of a, a treadmill from then on for the next how many years the band were together. Yeah. And it really was just recording, rehearsing, tour the Cold Rehearse Tour and we had signed up with a record company who were who were demanding, you know, a certain amount of records or I don't know if it was two albums a year or whatever it was, but it seemed like we were churning out music, you know, every other yeah. day. And um so that was pretty hectic, you know, and then did, eventually it did take its toll, I think, on Alex and Hugh in particular, both of them. Yeah. And when you when you start off in a lesser known band and then you get to become a working touring band that's sort of known around the country. Um, mm. did, did you have to sort of pinch yourself at the point where you thought, well, actually, you know, we're pretty successful here. How, how did it feel? Yeah, it was. It was kind of a little bit meteoric um, once it began to really, really kick off. And, um, you know, the gigs were, were, we were touring a lot, but playing a lot of gigs, any kind of gigs. But we could see, we could see there was a response. We could see the crowds were getting bigger and there was yeah. a little bit more hysteria. Uh, around the, the, the band and, and, and in general, and uh, so yeah, it was a good feeling, you know, that ego thing starts to take over and kick in, and you think, yeah, this is this is pretty cool, you know, prance about on stage and people sort of cheer for it, cheer you for it, and it's um, so yeah, it was cool and it was great, and the band were the band were great. As I say, Alex was very very focused. Yeah, he directly directed a lot of the visuals, a lot of the attack that the band had. He, it was like a cohort, you know. Yes. Of, so he he, he was he, every gig. So he was the director of the band, really, was he? Yeah, it was almost like a military campaign. You yeah. know, he, he, he had that sort of mindset of of being very focused and pointed towards the audience, and yeah, um, and, and you know his style of performing and his approach was kind of uncompromising. And I think you know a lot of people would say, yeah, yeah, I love Alex Harvey Band, you know, they hate them, you know, so yeah. A bit, a bit of that involved as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, the the fact that you had this, this makeup on, I, I guess it gave you some anonymity when you went out and about. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Not that we went out <laughs> about much, but yeah, it, um, nobody had a clue what you looked like in real life. No. So, no. you know, I kind of, I, I, I kind of played, I played up on that a little bit, I think, Did in you? terms of, you know, I thought it was quite enigmatic uh, to, 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 to have this sort of, you know, rather sort of mysterious, enigmatic kind of um, person, persona, and yeah. uh, it, it turned out to be a little bit of a, a bit of, yeah, it turned me into somebody who's who was a little bit um, diffident. I think the word is, you know, a bit, bit shy about things. So I tend to be I've always been a bit quiet, stood in the background a little bit, you know, because of that. But, yeah, no, I can see, I can see the. Um the, the, the gain in having a stage persona and, and coming off and not having it, you know, must must be quite good. Yeah, yeah. So um, then Alex left, didn't he? About what seventy eight was it? Yeah. Well, yeah. We had gone through, as I say, the touring side of things. We'd gone to America. We, you know, we tried to break America. We were very popular in certain pockets, certain yeah. areas like Cleveland, Ohio. There, sort of some of the. Steel Town, Pennsylvania, and they're there in New York, and, any, and, uh, and Chicago, and perhaps a little bit as well, but Cleveland in particular, yeah, and LA, a little bit of a little bit of interest there. But in general, the Midwest of America, they just couldn't really fathom fathom us out at all. You know, the real sort of redneck territory, they just couldn't fathom out what the band were. The theatrical side of things just looked a bit odd. Yeah, I think to a lot of people, English quirkiness. Yeah. Well, Scottish, well, sorry, Scottish. Scottish, I should say, shouldn't I? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've got to be very careful. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, Alex chose to sing with a Scottish accent, which yeah. was a bit of a, you know, and I was never convinced that it was going to be be a, a, a strong selling point, and I think that's still perhaps debatable. Um, what we did, what I did find out, and what I look back on with a little bit of a regret is that... Um, is that the band chose certain songs at certain at certain times. I mean, we were pressurised basically by the record company, the management company, to basically have hit singles. 
at that time. You had to be on top of the pops. And of course, we got lumped in to, you know, some of the songs that we chose I thought were very ill conceived. Um, even though Delilah was a hit for me, yeah. I mean, I hate the song, I hate the whole thing. But uh, did, did you, sorry to interrupt, did you not particularly enjoy doing Did you not particularly want to do it at the time? That not song? really, no, yeah. I just couldn't see the connection. I couldn't see, mm. for me, and I've said this often in interviews, for me, the competition wasn't sweet or mud or, heaven forbid, Gary Glitter. Yeah. For me, the competition was Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. Yeah. yeah. That's the bands that I kind of aspired to be. Yes, you know, yes. You know, so, so Giddy Up a Ding Dong and Dancing Cheek to Cheek and all of that stuff, yeah, all very theatrical and all yeah. very tongue-in-cheek, but I think for mainstream rock audience, it completely confused the issue altogether. Yeah, it did. I mean, the way I looked at it at the time, I mean, I, I bought the single Faith Healer because I just love that song. Uh, and I like yeah, St. Yeah. Anthony on the B-side as well, which I thought was really yeah, good. Yeah, St. Anthony is one of my favourites. Yeah, well, it's, it, yeah, it's very, very good and, and uh, almost prog metal, I guess, or prog heavy rock at the time. But yeah, I, I thought it was a very, yeah. very clever song. And then I saw, you, you know, you sort of appreciate that bands need to make a living and get more successful. So when that came out in Boston Tea Party... Um, you sort of went with it, and yeah. and you could say to your friends, "Look, I, I saw them, you know, and and now look at them, they're on top of the pops." <laughs> yeah, I mean, top of the pops. We never really. I just we never. I just couldn't take it seriously. Really, no. you know, the whistle test was better. You know, the whistle test you got to play live. Yeah. Yeah. Not all the time. I think eventually we got to play live. Top of the pops. I'm not sure we played live at all ever. I can't remember that. I think it was a musicians' union thing that you had to. Not yeah, there was all that carry on. Not quite yeah, sure why. Sure. Yeah, it was, all, it was all that stuff. And it was all, technically, it was always a, always a bit of a, a bit of a headache. It's good to see that the um, you can still pick some of that stuff on the old Grey Whistles test up at, on YouTube. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's quite a lot of nice, sad stuff on the whistle test, yeah. And then, the so, um, Alex, Alex left. Yeah, you were talking about Alex. Yeah. Yeah, well, the thing was, Alex, yeah, that day, that, 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 that point in time, Alex, his health hadn't been that great. And he, you know, the touring had been a real a real pressure on him. I think it really began to take its toll. Yeah. Uh, he was drinking heavily uh, on his own in his hotel room, all that sort of stuff. And his marriage wasn't in good, in good shape, as a few of us were suffering as well. So when we went into this rehearsal situation, we had a European tour lined up, headlining a European tour. So we were down in Shepperton Film Studios on the big sound stage down there with the whole production set up where you could have the whole thing up and running. And we just started rehearsals. And then one day Alex came in, uh, came up on the stage and just sat and said, hey guys, I, I can't do this anymore. Right. And we just looked at him. You could tell that he was just, he wasn't in shape. So yeah. that was that, was, that was that. He just wanted off to yeah. the taxi home and we were left thinking, yeah, okay, what might have been? Mm. And then, and then you carried on as Saab afterwards, didn't you, uh, without Alex? Yeah, we had a kind of. I know. Well, that was during, that was before the before the band split. Yeah, that was a period of time when when Alex took a bit of a a bit of a rest. Oh right. And yeah. we had an album called Four Play that we did. Yeah. Um, which was quite interesting musically, but it lacked a little bit of direction and vocal identity, and it was all right musically, but. It wasn't quite as um, it wasn't quite as as, as in the pocket. And, mm. I have, I have, I've, so, se- I've seen some of that. You did some old grey whistle stuff with that, didn't you? And um, yeah, that's that's. that's on there. And I noticed yeah. no makeup on that one. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I say it was all a bit kind of half-assed. Yeah. Because Alex wanted to take a break, but the record company wanted to have something to release, so, so there you go. It was all that sort, of, all yeah. that sort of stuff. But eventually, when the band did break up, and Alex did. You know, we got to, we got to the point of recording Rock Grill, yeah. And by that time, Hugh was extremely unwell, couldn't make it, and I brought in Tommy Air on keyboards, and Alex himself, as I say, wasn't 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 well during the the, the, the Rock Grill. He was suffering at uh, yeah. that point. So that album was it was it was tough to get it finished. Yeah. Even though I have to say, to be honest, there's a lot of the music on that album which is my favourite. Oh really? Sad music. Yeah, of, yeah. of all, yeah. In fact, my favourite Sab song is on there. It's a song called Dolphins. Dolphins, from the Rock Drill, the Rock oh, Drill right. album. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to give that a listen. So um, it split up, and I, I guess you were in quite high demand by people like Nazareth from then on, as you you know for your guitar skills. Well, 
Yeah, what happened really was that the Nalis decided to, to call it a day. We all just looked around and we all thought, well, hang on a minute. How are we going to pay the bills? How am I going to earn 200 quid a week? Because that's what we were getting paid at the time. Yeah. Which was all right at that time. But, and, but you know, that was it. It just stopped. It just finished. And I thought, well, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to pay the bills? Yeah. And the only thing I could do, I think of, was when I was living in North London, I just went down to the local minicab company, got a radio stuck in the car, and I drove a minicab around London for about a year or so. Uh, and that was the way to, that was the only way I could figure out to pay, pay the bills. And then yeah. I'd got a call, and then eventually I got a call from Manny Charlton, the guitar player in Nazareth. Yeah. I'd known Nazareth, we knew the guys, we were, we were in the same, we had the same management yeah. company. In fact, they, they owned the management company as a hand. And um, and we'd all played on Dan's McCafferty's solo album, so we were all good pals, you know. We all knew each other. And when I got the call from Manny, he says, "Yeah, we're doing a, an album. We were over on the Isle of Man for, uh, for tax reasons, I guess, with a room, with a mobile studio." And he says, "Come over and have a yeah. listen." So I came over, and um, and they were doing the No Means City album. And I think they were looking for a bit more input in terms of songs, musical content, and I had quite a few ideas lying around, so I threw them into the mix and played some guitar and uh, and then it kind of went on from there yeah because for, for listeners who perhaps don't know too much I mean you, you were um, apart from guitarist you were quite a big contributor in writing the songs weren't you yeah well then we did the second album with, uh, the second album I did with Nazareth was Malice and Wonderland and I wrote yeah. I think perhaps most of the songs not all but most of the songs on that album yeah. and that was recorded in the Bahamas Again, for tax reasons, no doubt. Uh, produced the uh, early 80s, yeah, in, uh, 1980, right about there. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Baxter from Steely Dan produced the album from the uh, Diddy Bros. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, it was okay. A couple of years in Nazareth. Showed the States, very big in the States. Very, very big shows, big concerts there. Not yeah. so big in Europe. Quite big in Japan. Did some work in Japan. Um, yeah. Stuck it out for a couple of years, but then they got to the point where they were, they were ready to do another album and go to the studio and record another album. And I went up to Good Family, up in, up in Fife in Scotland, and where the boys lived. And they said, Yeah, we're ready to do another album. And I was like, Okay. And they said, Well, um, it was almost like, say, Well, you write all the songs, Al, and you'll sit in the pub and have a drink while you're doing that. Oh, really? And I thought, mm, This is not going to work out too well. <laughs> and as it happens, it was all about kind of, you know, I just thought, no, I don't, I don't, I want to do something different now. I want to do something a little bit more, more avant-garde musically. And I thought, yeah, yeah Nazareth wasn't really the vehicle for that. Yeah. Yeah. So what did, I mean, I've, I've heard that you, you played with um, people like Elkie Brooks, Midjur. And... Yeah, I did some session work in the 80s. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. with Elkie. who was uh, excellent. And then Bonnie Tyler, I played with Bonnie for a couple of years or so. And then, yeah, I got a call from Ned Year, who was touring, about to go on tour with the, the Gift album that you just recorded, and had a couple of hit songs from that. Yeah. And, uh, again, it was a case of, um, sort of last minute, he'd been... Uh, it was Mick Ronson who had actually been uh, scheduled to do the gig. Oh, yeah. From Mid Midge, and I think things didn't work out. I don't know if Mick, Mick, Mick Ronson wasn't too well yeah. at the time or, or, or something, but anyway, it wasn't working out, and I got a call from the bass player who was working in the band who played with Elkie's band and he says could you come a couple of weeks before the tour and he says Al can you come down and, and step in and, and take over the gig so yeah that was that was really nice it was a really nice nice kind of music different music but kind of musical in its own way and Midge is a really fine guitar player himself so it was when we met we'd never met before but when we met we were like yeah we were like blood brothers it was like yeah we're both from Glasgow we knew each yeah. other you know, we knew each other, we knew of each other, so it was a very, it was a nice convenient sort of uh, gig, really. Yeah, he is a good guitarist, and I know he did a stint, a stint with Thin Lizzy, didn't oh, he? With Thin Lizzy. Yeah, but, and he always says he's he's like the worst guitarist that Thin Lizzy ever had, but, you know, I have heard him <laughs> play, and I think, I think he's pretty good. Yeah, well, you may, yeah, yeah. Don't <laughs> they never asked you, then, to play with them? With Thin Lizzy? Yeah. No, no, no. That would have been interesting, I we think. We toured, we toured, but not just we toured, we did our... An off and on headline tour with Lizzie and States, you know, where they would headline one night, Nazareth would headline the next night. So, yeah, it was Gary was playing and um, yeah. Scott Gordon, I think, was playing at that time. 
yeah, yeah, great stuff. And then after that, you had a bit of a gap away from it. Did you officially retire, or, or um, you just, you know, you just had enough yeah, of it for did, a while? Yeah, or? yeah, decided after. When Nazareth, when I stopped playing with Nazareth, I put together a little. I got, got I was contacted by Barry Barlow, the drummer from Jethro Tull, yeah, who who was interested in getting together. Uh, and they put a little thing together called Tanduri Cassette, which was musically very very interesting, a bit more interesting than than what I'd been doing previously. And I thought, yeah, yeah. it's really cool. This is nice. Enjoyed it, but it was music. It was in the wrong place at the wrong time, so it was. It was a little. It never really did much. It didn't. It didn't go anywhere. So what, was, it, kind of, was it? Was there an album? Did, did an album come out? No, no, no nothing recorded. Oh, that's well, a shame. we did record stuff, but I don't know. God knows where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not much came out of it, and, and at that point, that's when I started to do some session work, you know, with LK and Bonnie, and, and, and then eventually with Mitch. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, when the mid tour, you, the mid year tour finished, it, um, I kind of um, took a complete break from the business altogether and, and went into a kind of mainstream job of IT. Did you? Consultancy and uh, teaching c- computer program and running training courses and stuff like that, you know, so I had it's almost like a nine to five job. That's a big change. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a quantum leap, you know. I yeah. thought I better learn something. It was almost like you better, you know, I need to learn something else apart from just playing the guitar. And I thought, I thought computers were, yeah, I thought that's the future. Yeah, yeah get a computer, <laughs> learn how to do that. And, um, and it was fine, you know, it was okay. It was very mainstream. You've got a suit and tie on and you go and run a, run a seminar teaching people how to program computers. And it was fine um, up to a point. And then, you know, I bought, but I always struggled, you know, to, to, to kind of um, fit into that sort of mainstream sort of work ethic thing. And were you still sort of playing the guitar evenings and weekends? or do No, you... no, I didn't play the guitar at all. Oh, no, you just had a break But from... I'm not, it's a strange thing, I don't know if it's just me or other people, other musicians, but when I'm not playing professionally, yeah. when I'm not fully focused on, on writing or playing music, I tend not to play the guitar at all. I don't oh, pick right. it up at all, so... Oh, right. You know, so it was uh, I had a long, I had a good long break. Does uh, it take you a long time to sort of get, you know, take the rust off and when you get back into it or not? Yeah, not, not particularly. No, what happened was I got, I got a call eventually from Ted McKenna, the drummer, the Fab's drummer. Yeah. Who'd, lived, who'd moved back to Glasgow, near, near Glasgow, and he said, look, come on. He just had a little rehearsal room that he walked in and he kept his drums. And he got me back playing again, you know, he said, yeah. guitar, come down and have a play, you know, and I, him and I and Alan Thompson, bass player, um, one of my favourite bass players. We got a little, you know, we had a little more, more like fusion stuff we were doing, like jazz, fusion, rock. Yeah. And that was nice. It got me back into playing, got my, my fingers going again, as you said. And um, and that kind of snowballed into reforming a version of Sab. Yeah. In the mid, around about, I can't remember exactly, the beginning of 1991, somewhere like that. And we go out, we dragged in a singer called Stevie Doherty, who had a fantastic voice, but not terribly suited to stab on the material of the theatrics at all. But yeah, we did a little live recording with him. Yeah. And then I thought, well, no, this isn't really, it wasn't really going anywhere. So that kind of folded up for a bit. And then about, around about the mid 2000s, somewhere in there, we, I got a call again from, from Ted and everybody saying, look, look there's a guy called Max Maxwell, who, who, who might be the, the front man for a reformed fab and might just be the, you know, the right thing for us to do. Yeah. And when I saw Max and I met him and we rehearsed with him, I thought, yeah, this guy's got a lot of visual. Uh, you know, he had, a, he had a, a really good look, he had a really good approach, and it kind of got me back interested in sort of getting the band back together again. Yeah. So that that's what we did for about a year or two again, back in about 2006, 2007. And then there was a gap until your last project. Yeah, again, it was it was um, it was a case of how far can we go with Saab. And one of the one of the things, the main thing for me at, the, at that point in time was I was desperate for us to look to get to get some new material done. Yes. Write some new songs, get some new music. And the response I got from everybody else was really rather lukewarm and not terribly enthusiastic. So I thought, well, you know, guys, I'm, I, I can't. I can't go up here and prance about to Delilah night yeah. after night. It's just not happening. 
you know, I just felt like I was becoming a tribute to myself, and it yeah. just, nah, it just wasn't good. No. And no. then new ideas I was coming up with, as I say, they didn't really get, they didn't really get in the light of day. So I thought, nah, it's time to call it quits, and I called it quits. And I, at that point, my marriage had broken down, and I'd, um, uh, I'd met my partner, my future partner. We just got together, moved down to the Yorkshire. And, yeah, and we got together in about, about two thousand and seven, something two thousand and eight. Yeah, and then you did you stay? You went to Cyprus, I believe, for a bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, what happened was my partner Rachel, she got a job, a job took us out to Cyprus. Yeah, she had a contract that took us out there with the Ministry of Defence. Um, oh, okay. To have some, some British bases and I and, and so anyway, it took us out to Cyprus for a bit. Three, four years we were yeah. out there and um, and it was wonderful it was really nice obviously it's uh, a nice place I, I've been there several times really nice place yeah beautiful place I yeah. Mean, it's, 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 uh, yeah I miss it a lot I miss the main reason the people the yeah. people are just absolutely wonderful wonderful yeah. people we, we stayed at a place called, called Polis which is Polis yeah, yeah it's nice up on that um, west, west yeah, coast yeah all part. good I mean it was all, yeah. all good up to a point yeah. and um, I hadn't played for about 10 years I hadn't picked the guitar up for about 10 years. But wow. during that period, during that time in Cyprus, I went through an extremely bad um, mental breakdown. Oh, dear. Sorry. Uh, due to um, depression and anxiety and so on. It just became a real... Uh... Anyway, it was a really bad, bad, bad episode. Yeah. And Rachel was... she, You know, bless her, she, she she took the brunt of it and she looked after me quite a bit and got me back to, my, to, to some degree of help. Yeah. But uh, during that whole episode, I... I thought I need to do something here to get myself out of it, and that's when I picked the guitar up again, again for the first time in ten years. And, yeah. Um, a little acoustic guitar I had lying around, and I just picked it up more as a form of therapy than anything yes. else. And and lo and behold, it kind of started to work. I started to get song ideas, started to get some some more uh, you know riffs and things that you do, just yeah. writing a few bits and pieces, and it started to snowball. And it did eventually snowball into a band called Thin Dogs. That's um, that's wonderful, though, the way that the guitar, you got back to your guitar yeah. and your roots, and, yeah, it, and it helped it you was, through that. It yeah. It's, and it's kept me going ever since, to be honest. That's really good. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've heard the Sin Dogs album, um, and I've seen a bit on YouTube, and it probably, I would desc- I mean, I would describe it as almost sort of, not exactly new metal, but sort of dystopian metal. Um, <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, and, and there was a band. I mean, funny, strangely enough, I, I got out of music bit when my three daughters were growing up. And then I think it was in about 2006, they were playing on the computer and the speakers. They were putting through Kill Switch Engage and in a trio yeah. and a lot yeah. of this sort of screamo metal. I thought, hang on a minute, oh, I quite like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a style of music and a style of. Yeah, it's a style of music. For me, Thin Dogs is when you go, I was almost like going to feel sucked all the way back to Tear Gas. Yeah. It was like trying to recreate the kind of heavy guitar driven, you know, music that that, that I just kinda of kicked off with the way back in, in the late sixties. Yeah. So and it was nice, it was good for me. Obviously the whole productive thing was great for me personally. Yeah. For my health and, and my mental health. Yeah. But um again it was one of those little bit ill fated, you know, the direction was getting pulled in all different in disparate ways and it was just another one of those classical examples of you know, too much musical difference going on and too much conflict and a few two egos thrown, thrown about to, um, and I thought no it's not uh, it's not quite going in the right direction anymore So and now you're working with Orphans of the Ash Yeah Billy McGonagall the other guitar player and, and Sindogs him and I have a great deal in common and uh, you know it was one of the things I noticed when I first put Sindogs together was how, how much kindred spirits we were and the yeah. style of playing, the music that we enjoyed, listening to and the influences that, we, that had brought us to where we are now. And um, so Billy and I decided to to end Send Dogs and put together um, uh, the Orphans of the Ash Project, which is really just the two of us for the time being. Yeah. Uh, we just work on songs ourselves. We have a studio in, in Billy's house in Glasgow where we do the recordings. And we've got about, we've got ourselves now about three, four songs all ready to go for the album, which is scheduled to come out next spring. 
Oh, I should look, look forward to that. Is, is it going to be similar to Sin Dogs, would you say? Or, or, um, it's going to be... It's going to have... Yeah, it's going to have no keyboards, though. No keyboards. <laughs> less keyboards, no. let's say. It's just yeah. more guitar driven, a little bit more grunge, and a little oh, bit yeah. more, as you say, dystopian, perhaps, um, in, in the outlook. But yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much heavy rock. Yeah. At the end of the day. No, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, nothing wrong with that at all. It, it's, I mean, I like keyboards and they they come in very well, but if it's going to be an all guitar band, that would be quite exciting, I think. Well, as I said, it's, it's it's the kind of guitar playing that comes very naturally to me. You know, yeah. I've, I've played different styles, working with different people, and it's and it's been a learning curve and it's been good for my discipline at times. But my general approach to guitar is that I, I don't I don't I don't need a lot of. Um, a lot of discipline. I tend to play, I tend to play a little bit off the cuff a lot of the time, and sort of Billy. So we, 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 you know, it's more improvised a lot of the time, especially when you come in like soloing and doing sort of, you know, that sort of stuff. So yeah. Interesting yeah. you're saying about off the cuff and all. If I could just go back, if you don't mind, to Alex, the Sensational Alex Harvey band, where you did your guitar solos. Did you find that you varied them when you were playing live at all, or was it the same? Yeah. So- well, yeah, all the all the most of the most of the guitar solos recorded with Fab were all done off the cuff. Were they? they were all they were all improvised. Yeah, yeah. And just recorded live at the time. Wow. Yeah, maybe one or two takes and say, right, that'll do. It. And for me, that's the, it's how I get it's how I get the, uh, the the adrenaline and how I get the energy. Yeah. To play is, is by doing that. Um, so those solos on yeah. on yeah those solos on framed they they were sort of improvised at the time, were they? Yeah, yeah. It's all yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. And going back to sort of up to up to date now, and probably some of the history of, of, of your songwriting. What what's your sort of process about writing a song? How do you go about it? Um, it's kind of developed and changed a little bit over the years. When I when I started to write in Cyprus, I realised that um, it was going to be my voice that was going to have to kind of carry the thing. I thought, well, for a start, I'm not a great singer. I don't really. I'm not you know, renowned as a, as as having a sort of singer's voice, as it, but I thought, you know, because I was writing the lyrics and because I was singing the song to myself, yeah, uh, wandering about the house and singing, I thought, well, it's going to be me who's going to have to sing, and um, and that was a big step to try and put myself, you know, in the fo- in, in the limelight, as you know, you're not just the guitar player, but you're also you're going to be the vocalist and you're going to be the sort of focal point of this thing. Yes. Um. So that has drawn a drawn a kind of a a kind of line under what I did in the past, and it's, it's brought me into a, an area which is I don't always feel that comfortable doing it. But where I am now, I don't really have any choice, and I don't really feel the need to um, compromise to a degree and, and and compete perhaps with people who can sing all the way up to there and all the way down to there. I don't. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something I don't really enter into anymore. I have, I have my own style of doing it. Yeah. And if it works, it works. If not, it doesn't. It's, it's, well, I, th- I think your voice yeah. come, comes across very well in Govan Boy. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 as I say, it's, it's, I think it's like many singers, you, you tend to sort of shy away when you hear your own voice. You go, oh, no, I don't want to hear that anymore. But, um, mm. yeah, there's a way of getting it to work. Put it that way. So can we expect... Um, like I said, I've, I've listened to the Sin Dogs album quite a lot, and what I noticed is quite a bit of light. Uh, I know it's an overused term, but quite a lot of light and shade. So, you know, yeah. the metal comes in after a while, but before that, some really beautiful, sort of tender melodies. Yeah, can we expect yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, we've got a few songs that's sitting around that are uh, that are in that vein. I mean, one of the things that Billy and I enjoy writing is is not just it's not just a little song, you know, a four four minute song. We also like writing music for uh, more like score music for, for films or uh, oh, yeah. adverts, that kind of thing. Yeah. So we've got a lot of stuff lying around that's more cinematic. Um, uh, whether that gets into the album or onto the album, I'm not sure. We're kind of in the process of debating how we, what sort of real direction the first album should be, should take, and and, yeah. um, and whether we should just focus on, you know, song by song by song, or whether we want to put on some, we've got some nice instrumental pieces of music that would be very listenable and very, very enjoyable, but yeah. I don't know, I don't know how they would fit that. Yeah, so that sounds exciting, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 
are you, what, what sort of music are you listening to at the moment, Zah? I don't really... I stopped really listening to rock music some years ago. I don't really listen to rock bands, you know. I can't no. get... You know, over the years, you sort of get the picture, you know, you say, yeah, I know, I know what that's all about, and I know where that's going, and you put on, put on a, a song for two seconds, you go, yeah, I know where that's going to go. <laughs> so you get a little bit blasé, and I hate to sort of be in that sort of position, but... So I don't really listen to much much rock music. I listen mainly to classical music, film score music, um... Mostly film score music, a little bit of Debussy now and again, a lot of Stravinsky. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if there were two bands to, I would pick out, two bands that I would go back to and listen, listen to perhaps in more recent years, there, there would be there would be Radiohead. Yeah. And uh, Soundgarden. Oh yeah, yeah. My two, fa- two favorite bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good bands. Yeah, yeah. So you've you've you know you've been in the music industry for a long time, on and off. What advice would you give someone who is thinking of entering the music industry these days? <laughs> <laughs> advice. My advice to anyone entering the music business is stay in tune and stay out of debt. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I guess, I don't know whether it's the same now, but the excesses of fame and music must be very, very uh, tempting for everybody. Yeah, yeah I, well, I never approached it with the idea of becoming rich. I never started off at school thinking I was going to be a millionaire. Or, no. You know, I was going to be Elton John or something or, or, or whatever, or anybody. It was purely the love of music that got me involved, and it's still the love of music that keeps me going now. Yeah. So I don't really have any any uh, starry-eyed ambitions about about being rich and famous because um, I never have been. <laughs> <laughs> what other projects you have coming up, Sal? The only other project I have had is uh, a novel that I've been working on for a few years, and it's now in the state of... Um, I'm working on the final draft of, of, of that book. So that's something which I alternate between music and, and the writing of the, 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 the book. Yeah. Is that, is that your first novel? Yeah, it would be, yes, if I can get it, get it published. I have a publisher-editor, yeah. a guy called Nick Pollard, who's very, very good and who's very, very supportive and helps helps me quite a bit with it. So uh, I, I can't really put up. I can't put a day. I mean, the album music wise, yeah, I can put a, a date on those things. But in, in terms of the novel, I can't really. It'd be nice to have it finished by next year, I suppose. Yeah. So, so in t- without sort of giving away spoilers, what what's what's it about, Sal? The novel's about. It's called Rule R O O L. Yeah. And the subtitle is Orphans of the Ash. Oh. Yeah. And it's a set in the future. It's about a quick synopsis would be it's about evolution, really. It's about how our species have evolved, how yeah. other species on the planet have have evolved, and the hybrids that have come from both, and how the um, the struggle for power and ruling the whole of the planet has become a kind of a two way a two way battle between these uh, let's call them tribes or species. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's a kind of an ongoing struggle. There's lots of fighting. There's lots of political intrigue. Uh, and there's a little love story that sort of trails all the way through it. That sounds really exciting. So it's a bit of an Orwellian Wells type of um, it's got a bit of that, yeah, thing absolutely, going on. Absolutely, yeah. 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 I can see the dystopian thing, a theme coming up again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of my mindset, just dystopia. Yeah. I think it's where I'm headed for, yeah. Very strange times at the moment, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, it feels like we've been dragged towards something, um, something like that. You know, all the, uh, the predictions seem to be pointing towards some kind of dim and gloom, I suppose. I suppose we have to keep our chins up. I'm sure it'll all, all be okay in the end. Yeah, yeah. For a, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said earlier, you know, I've, I've overcome my depression with you know the aid of music and yeah. and medication, and it's uh, so I can I can operate and I can you know I can I can get through a day fairly productively now yeah that's, that's fantastic stuff well it's been really great talking to you where, where can um, people find out a bit more about your work so uh, the only place really is on Facebook but I have a page there and I keep people um, updated with Orphans of the Ash music and, uh, and, and Billy and I post things there now and again yeah. but um, yeah it's just that's, that's about the only place to, to get any information well that's great I'll, I'll put that on the show notes Zal, so that people yeah, can um, go straight to it so thanks ever so much for coming on the show thank you no thank you Paul thanks nice, nice interview thanks for your time you 
have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best. <laughs>